let's look at example three. Come down just a little bit more. Okay. You have an airplane. It's flying at an airspeed at 100 miles per hour and heading at 30 degrees south of east. Okay. So let's look at the picture for just a second. Give yourself, like, okay, you're, you're having this vector of 100 miles per hour. And it looks like VPA is the vector of the plane. And the way they gave their directions is a little bit different from what we have in the book. We're used to saying, um, I guess, instead of south of east, we, we, draw, we say southeast. But what they're saying is they gave it from the east position. As you can see, this is east. It's off to the right. And we went south of it. So that's why it's just down 30 degrees right there. Okay. So from the east, we went south. Whereas normally in all of our problems that we have in our book, you know, we always go, any of these bearings ones, we give ourselves a north-south bearing, we go from there. But we, we can still do it. It's nice to have it changed up just a little bit. Okay. So the airplane flies at an airspeed of 100 miles per hour going 30 degrees south of east. If the velocity of the wind is 20 miles per hour due west, so that's this port part right down there. It's directly due west right here. Okay. And we want to determine the resultant velocity of the plane with respect to the ground. Okay, so if this plane is coming down kind of south of east, and then we've got this wind pushing against it, that's what it's wanting to do, is to find the resulting vector that's happening because of this. And let's look at these, what these, I declared these variables over here on the right. You have the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. So it's like normally the plane would be coming down here. But because all of a sudden we have this wind extra ailing it, the plane is now coming down at a, another angle, okay, and that's what we're looking at. Where the velocity of the PA is the velocity of the plane relative to the air, and the velocity of the plane relative to the ground, and then of course V of A is the velocity of the air, okay. So our key equation is the fact of the velocity of the plane relative to the ground is made up of two components, the velocity of the plane relative to the air, and the velocity of the air itself, okay. So what we got to do is break this all down, and then we can find our answer our question. Okay. So let's take this information that we have, and let's find our vectors in each of their components. Okay. So the velocity of the plane relative to the air is going to be basically its magnitude, which it says the plane was flying at 100 miles per hour, so it's 100 times the cosine of the angle it's flying at, which they said was 30 degrees times the unit vector, okay? And then plus, again, the, un the vector here. And since the plane is pointed down, since we're going south of east, we're going to write it as a negative 100, okay? Got to always pay close attention to that, times the sine of its 30 degrees times j, okay? And filling this all in, then, the velocity of the plane relative to the air. By the time I go 100 times cosine of 30 degrees, you're going to get 50 square roots of 3 times the i unit vector, and then times 50 times j unit vector, miles per hour. Okay. Let's do the same thing with the air. So the velocity of the air is going to be, okay, it's equal to its vector, which it said the air speed was going 20 miles per hour. So, and since it's going 20 miles per hour due west, and since of the west and the, the x, this is the x component right here, and due west is negative on the x-axis, we got to go negative there, times its i component. So there's no angle because if it's due west, you know we're at zero degrees, okay? And the cosine, I guess you, I could have written in there cosine of zero degrees, which the cosine of zero or Think about it more like this. How about maybe we treat it like this? If I even said 20, but then it would have been the cosine due west is 180 degrees, and what's cosine of 180 is negative 1, and therefore you can see it also making it why it's negative right there. Or you can just consider because it's going due west, it's going left. Okay? And now we have to add on the y component. Let's think about that. Again, if I did the 20 times the sine of 180, well, the sine of 180 is 0, so there is no y component there. And then miles per hour. So pretty much that's all that we have for the airspeed, okay? So let me kind of take some of this away so we can keep it all cleaned up. And let's keep on going. 
So the grand equation we're looking to find is the velocity of the plane relative to the ground. So it should be the sum of the two x components, which is going to be 50 square roots of 3 minus 20 times the unit vector of i, and then the sum of the y components, so negative 50 plus 0, I guess if you want to say, and its j component. And putting this together and um, actually plugging this in our calculator and adding these up, we'll get our final answer. 50 square roots of 3 minus 20 comes out to be 66.6. .6. So why don't we, just because we don't like to write 66.6, .6, yes, we can be superstitious. So let's write this as 67 um, with the unit vector i. And then minus, why do I keep, let's go minus, and then 50 times j. Okay, so that's the vector component of the airplane broken down into its x and y components. And I guess if we wanted to, we can go miles per hour on that, by the way. And then if we wanted to find the magnitude and the direction of it, okay, so the magnitude it's got the plane. It's going to be the square root of the x component. So we'll say 67 squared plus a negative 50 squared, which is equal to an 83.3 miles per hour. Okay, so what that's doing is taking this general vector right here and actually breaking it down into the magnitude. And then if we want the direction, then theta is going to be the inverse tangent of the y over the x, so negative 50 over 67. And that gives us a theta of negative 36.9 degrees. All right, so there you go, there's the magnitude. Something else that we can box up in that specific direction right there. So let's f keep going and look at our very last problem of this project. Okay, static equilibrium. What you have here is a hundred is a hundred kilogram object hanging from two cables of equal length. Okay, and we want to determine the tension of each cable. So right now everything's in equilibrium in the sense of this one hundred one thousand kilogram object is not swaying either way. So that's why this whole key right here, the sum of the forces equals zero. The force that this cable over here is providing is going to equal out with the force over there that it's providing plus the force of actual gravity pushing against it. Okay, so if we look at kind of a drawing without more in terms of the tension vectors, T1 and T2, and their different angles, okay, the weight, the actual force being plied down isn't just a thousand kilograms. What I'm saying here is it's a thousand kilograms, but by the time that you add in the force that gravity is pushing against it, then we actually have a grand force of 9,810 newtons. Okay, so really what's equilibrium is the fact of we have to add up the two tensions that's being applied by those cables, plus if you want to say the weight tension, and then all of that is what has to equalize out to zero in order to keep everything in balance and everything in equilibrium. Okay, so to solve this problem, Let's go back to what the problem was asking us to do. We want to determine the tension in each cable. Okay, so what we need to do is take each cable and focus on breaking it down into its components. Okay, so the vector component for cable one is going to be its tension times the cosine of the angle, which is 45 degrees, plus its tension times the sine of the angle. Okay, so we're just breaking it down into its portions, and each time, I forgot to put in there the unit vectors, of course. And let's think about this real quick. T1, you see how T1 is off to the left, but it's up? If it's off to the left, that means that the x component, the cosine component, has got to be negative. But because it's up, then the y value is still positive. Okay, the tension, the unit vector for the, or the vector for the second tension, okay, that one's going off to the right and up, so they're both positive. So it's going to be T1, sorry, T2, because we're finding T2, cosine of 45 degrees times the unit vector, and then T2 times the sine 
of 45 degrees times its unit vector. Okay, if we do the weight vector, okay, then we think about it, that's just straight down. Does it have any x component? Is there anything going right or left with it? No. So it's actually 0 times the x portion of it. And then because it's going down, we're going to go minus, which would be like it's, this is like w1 times cosine of theta, which in this case is, I guess down would be 270 degrees. That's where we get in the first part. And then weight of the vector, which is 9810. And since it's down, that's why the sine of, two, of 270 degrees is a negative one, so that's why we're also making it negative. Okay, and all of these are in terms of newtons. Okay, so finishing this up and going further along with this, then we know that the sum of all of these, so this T1 plus T2 plus W needs to equal zero. Okay, or we can think about it is let's add up all the i portions or all the x portions, which are the i unit vectors plus all the y portions or the j unit vectors, and that should equal zero. So negative t1 and then the cosine of 45 degrees, which is square root of 2 over 2, plus t2 times the square root of 2 over 2 plus zero. All of that times the i unit vector. Okay, now let's go to the y ones. t1 times the sine, which is square root of 2 over 2, plus t2 times the sine of 45 degrees, so square root of 2 over 2, minus 9810 times the unit vector of j. All of that should equal to 0. Okay, so it's adding those three equations with a key part being that all of that should sum up to zero. All right, let's keep going. Okay, so there's this little trick to this. And if you notice, looking at T1 and T2, if that weight is going to be sitting there and not moving any direction, that means that the tension that's being applied in the first direction and the tension being the supplied in the second direction should be equal to each other. So if we take that fact right there, and say, okay, we know that T1 has to equal T2. That's going to be a big change in our problem because if T1's got to equal T2, let's come to this very, very first parentheses. It's basically saying that if I change this T2 right there to a T1, look, a negative T1 of square root of 2 over 2 plus T1 of square root of 2 over 2, that's wiping out this whole thing right here. And then if I change this over here to a T1, and then that we can just work with that, and that'll be a little bit easier to solve. Okay, okay. so now that we have two like terms over here in this right parentheses, it's basically saying the square root of 2 over 2 plus the square root of 2 over 2 times T1, because they're both common in the front, minus 9810 is going to equal 0. So if we divide all that through, you're going to get a T1 value of 6,937 newtons. All right, there's one of our answers. And since we also know that T1 has to equal T2, we can just do that and call this problem finished.